Well, welcome to part two, an in-depth look into the Benjamin Trail XL rifle. If you didn't see part one, a video link for that video is gonna be below in the description area. Um, so here we are, we're getting a closer look of the Benjamin Trail. Uh, part one, I mentioned it, it was my favorite brake barrel magnum. I was so excited to see what I saw on the bench, how well this was made, the good steel. It does need that aftermarket trigger blade, but most of us know that. And this one came with that because I bought it used in 22 cal. So here it is. It's made very well. Now, I didn't have the barrel block bank fold fit that I thought it did. It basically, I took a closer look with my shop glasses and it was not a bank fold fit, but it wasn't bad either. The way this gun's built, by all means, it should be in the winner's circle other than the fact that uh, it needs the aftermarket gold trigger blade to make the trigger quite usable. Um, but anyway, what do we find on this gun? If you go to YouTube, and I did, you'll see a lot of guys there's either a couple of guys that were getting really good groups at 50 yards okay so there's those guys right the gold ticket winner guys then you had guys i think maybe around 30 yards they thought they had good groups but as far as i'm concerned they really weren't and then you had guys who thought their gun was great because they could hit a can at 22 yards and they thought that was awesome and then you will finally come down to a guy that couldn't even find the right pellet for the gun because it was just not consistent or shooting properly properly and it couldn't get any kind of accuracy out of their gun and that's what you find with the benjamin trail and as far as i can see we shouldn't have that this gun should be in the winner circle taking home the trophy but it's not and that's what we're here to talk about all right so what do we find on the gun that could cause this gun not to perform number one off the bat was the cool shroud now this is a mock-up because it's not the shroud i have the gun getting ready to be coated. so basically uh, the shroud has the screw on end cap and if you break the barrel back to load it and you turn this loosen or tighten it that's going to change the tension on the barrel and once you do that it's going to change the barrel harmonics every time you shoot the gun and that's going to cause your impact to shift now you could put that to use if you have a fairly decent accurate one where you maybe you can use this to dial in your barrel harmonics and you put the tension on your barrel to the sweet spot to where hey you know what my groups just tightened up a little bit better at that area now i'm not saying that's going to happen but you could certainly try to see if that it does happen so you can take it off there's an allen right there and then scrub the threads off with a wire brush and get your blue lock tight and set it to that spot and also the front cap had those four holes remember um, and now when you shoot the pellet through some of the air goes through those holes from the shot begins to fill the tube up and now becomes a dampener on your sound like a suppressor because not all the muzzle blast is going out some of it's filling up the tube you could try to make those holes bigger maybe it'll be even um, a lot less louder or maybe it won't do anything at all or maybe it'll be louder but you can try that out and if it doesn't work you can get another one across Crossman. They have parts for these guns. All right, so we found that. We know an easy fix for that, and that's okay. So second thing I found on the gun, it has a nice wide breech seal. Typical breech seals aren't that wide. So the wide breech seal is good, but it's also very hard. And if it's not set in there properly with this type of Magnum gun, if you create too much tension between the receiver and the barrel block, basically you could cause that barrel block to jo uh, josh or jog a little bit when you shoot the gun, right? It only takes a little bit. You do need tension on your breech seal. It has to seal, and you do need a little bit of tension, but it has to be in a certain area where it's not overdone by the sun. And basically, a lot of them are okay anyway, but I don't like the tightness of the breech seal. It should have been a little bit softer material. Not soft, soft, but not that hard. But anyway, there he is in a nutshell. The breech seal could cause you to have a problem, and that could happen on any air rifle. Now, you guys out there, you know something about air guns you've been doing this for a while you have some information that you've learned over the years or saw online or read what do you think the third problem is with this gun and i'm going to call it the major problem right off the bat because what all means like i said this gun should be in a winter circle i mean even the thumb hole stock bolts up rock solid on this gun so you think about it and if you get the answer i'm going to send you this gun you, i'm going to get your number and phone number and all that good stuff and you can have the gun just tell me what you think the problem was, and if you're right, you can have it. How's that sound? Sound great? 
Well, it's not going to happen, but it sure does sound good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you said barrel, sorry, I had to do that. If you said barrel, you're absolutely right. You hit it right on the button. Now, the barrel and air guns, I don't know if you realize or not, is the biggest thing that are overlooked by the manufacturers. And it's my, I have my number one pet peeve with these gun makers that make these. Now, I'm pretty sure, but I don't know for sure, that Crossman slash Benjamin has a company making their stuff for them, right? And so they put the order out and then they go and get these guns and they ship them to Benjamin slash Crossman and they got to undo the whole thing and go through them. And now they have to sell them. But I don't know who's keeping up with the specs and the uh, quality control on the pellet to bore fit. This is the most thing that's overlooked in the air rifle um, today, basically, on a lot of these guns that are being made. It's very difficult to get a good pellet to bore fit barrel. Now, also, these barrels, like um, the Benjamin Trails or, say, a Turkish barrel or a Chinese gun, a lot of those types of guns can have an absolutely filthy, dirty barrel i seen some of them even had some bits of rust in them. So the thing about one of these guns is you really need to thoroughly clean the bore. This is not a Viroc or an Air Arms. You really need to get into the bore and clean it. Now, I did a video clip on that to show you what I'm talking about. Now, the reason I say that is because you do that... If you go to clean your barrel, say you get the gun, right? And you say, hey, wait, well, first thing we need to do is clean the barrel because that's what Mike says. So we're going to clean our barrel. But if you don't clean it properly and you think it's clean just because your first run of patches is now coming out clean and then you go to do your pellet test the pellet to bore test to see hey what what kind of barrel do i have do i got a good pellet to bore fit is it something wrong with my barrel and then basically you're going to get fake readings and now when you go to shoot your gun in your mind you checked it off that my barrel was cleaned and it was good bore pellet fit but my gun's still not shooting right but you're not going to go back to the barrel because in your mind you checked it off as being good so i did a video on how i got to clean these types of barrels and again i'm going to say these are not virox these are not high-end guns and those guns don't tend to come out that bad when it comes down to the barrels and the bores as far as dirt wise they can typically get a basic type of cleaning and you're fairly good but anyway so there's the one thing right off the bat it's a barrel now i had this came in in 22 and i pulled the barrel for a project i had and then and later on i got a 25 cal barrel when i finally got into this gun again i found out that the barrel was bad but anyway that's the problem with these guns and they're not the only one but i don't know who if it was my company and i was putting an order out there see this is the thing you don't know who, whoever's behind all this stuff what do they really know about air guns now i'm going to say this real quick and i'm not trying to bash it's just the craziest stuff you ever seen you know you spend your money right like 300 some dollars and you expect everybody out there to do their job according to the daisy chain so when you get your gun it's all done right and that's just not what happens and it happens the same with a lot of other guns okay let's you get into the high-end guns like a Viroc or Air Arms, that's a different category. But all these other guns, it's 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 like they don't even realize it's an air rifle. You know where it says on the box, this is not a toy. I think in my mind that they must think it's a toy and all they need to do is get the pee through the straw and we're good and then get this thing up, packed, pallet it and shipped and get the money in for it. But this is the stuff that happens all the time. So anyway, you know, you spend your hard-earned money and you, you expect to get one. And then you're, you know, you're depressed or you're sad because yours doesn't shoot as good as Joe's does and you don't know why. So this is the stuff that goes on with air guns all the time. Now, all right, now what are we doing to do with our gun? I'm not going to go to cross when you can get parts. Um, and I would advise you if you need to get another barrel for your gun and you're going to buy one, you would tell them, look, when I get my barrel from you guys, I'm going to thoroughly clean it like Mike showed me. And then I'm going to do the pellet to bore test. And if my barrel doesn't have a good pellet to bore fit, I want to return it to get another one until I do get a good barrel. And that's your right. Because, you know, they get these guns and now they got to sell them and they got to sell them however they came out from the people that made them. And the people that make them are not staying on top of the bore quality control. It's the biggest thing in air guns that gets gets almost forgotten half the time. I don't think they realize you need a decent pellet to bore fit in an air rifle. And you know what? Um, real quick, um, Hatson's no different. They make their own guns, so they're basically at fault too. So this is just the stuff that goes on. Okay, back to our gun. I'm trying to speed this up because I don't want it to take too long. 
What did we do with our gun? Well, we did a lot. We um, basically, I found a 22 Lola Walder barrel in my shop that was a remnant, and I knew that the end of the bore was oversized. So it was just sitting here. I threw a lot of other barrels out that were totally bad. And it's 14 and a half inches, but I was able to tighten up that end of the bore by doing good machine work when I did the barrel block to bore fit up. And I was able to tighten up the bore. And now I got a 14 and a half inch barrel that has a good barrel pelt to bore fit. Now in the end, instead of doing a choke, I just did a little short piece instead of the choke. And now it's a piece that was press fitted on to snug up the end of the bore like that. It's about an inch and a quarter piece piece of steel right here with a plastic insert on top. So that's what we got for a barrel. So we should be looking pretty good with that. All right, let me jump ahead here. What else did we do for this gun while I have it in the shop? Well, I looked at the piston and earlier in part one, since I couldn't do an O-ring bearing, a Delrin bearing ring, uh, there's not enough room and I don't like to do piston buttons. I just took the center of the piston down and that way we can have the front and the rear riding in a tube. But now part two, we're going in deeper. We're trying to round it all up now. And we found what we found and now we're trying to get this gun to come together so i decided to upgrade the piston seal now i had a brand new piston seal from the um, crossman company and uh, i decided not to use it so what i did is i basically took the button off the piston remachined a whole new button installed it on the piston so I can put a different seal on there. Now, you're wondering whose seal I'm using. Well, I got a good friend of mine named Rich Shar. Now, Rich has developed a proper hats and piston seal for those hats and magnums, okay? You guys know I do the videos and put them out there to help you out. Well, Rich is a good friend of mine and we've both been messing with these hats for a good while and uh, trying to make them shine. Rich has actually got fed up enough to develop his own piston seal with a seal maker and they, we were putting them in the hats and guns and they are really turning the hats and magnum around now i'm pretty sure everybody knows what a hats and magnum looks like i have this guy sitting here it's been here for a couple years now okay i haven't had time to go through it but i got a nice uh 25 cal mike sayers barrel fort that he made me before he retired to fit my pellets for this gun anyway getting back to rich developed a proper seal for the hats and magnum these are very powerful guns more than the benjamin and basically they are a game changer they really give the hats and magnum what it finally needs so what's the deal with the new seal well i'll tell you Number one, the piston seal edge isn't going to burn off because your typical seals, how they come from the factory or how they come from the aftermarket guys that make them, are just basically made the way non-magnum guns are. So when you stick them in a magnum gun within a short period of time, probably about two days, your seal edge is going to start to burn off, right? Because these magnums are very powerful and like creates a lot of heat and then you're left with your typical piston slam and then you're left with your feet per second doing whatever they do nothing smooth and steady it's basically kind of like you know hit and miss uh, as far as what you get as far as consistency but you typically get your piston slam and then you're going to live with it and then you're going to like it because if you want a magnum that's what you're going to have to deal with but now richest seals are a game changer because number one the piston seal edge isn't going to burn off and now number two they're also making Made so that it utilizes the available swept volume in the air rifle that it's in so instead of losing some of that right with a piston seal it lost its edge basically it's gathering everything that's available and putting it to use and what happens is you get your feet per second in the gun if not more and then the gun's a lot smoother and the best thing of all your piston seal edge isn't going to burn off so that was finally came out with something that's actually in the gun working for the gun not just to make the gun work you follow me it's in the gun doing a job making the gun work a lot better and for the gun so here we are we got a new piston seal well i think by now we're looking pretty good and by the way you know here's a here's an example hatson makes all these guns and then i'll get out of your hair and here's a big 135 with a 10 and a half inch barrel you know what that tells me it tells me they can make a gun but they don't know much about air guns right that's why the bores are not looked into properly right and that's why you get hit and miss barrels from hats and some have good bores some don't this is the stuff that constantly goes on now sticking in a 10 and a half inch barrel on a gun like that is absolutely ridiculous so as far as a magnum gun you may wonder why because it's not just a piston seal the breed seal and a magnum gun 
Uh, it, it takes several different components to help hone a magnum in. Now, a lot of guys are out there are basically shooting what I call shipwrecks, and they have no idea. They just think that's the way it's supposed to be. But you can hone a magnum in. You just need certain things to come in a proper order. It's not just a good proper piston seal that Rich developed. There's other things also, but we're not going to get into that right now. But you can hone a magnum in. Now, they'll never be in the realm of being balanced like a non-magnum, right? Non-magnum guns don't surpass that line. They're on that line where there's some sort of balance, even if it's rough. But when you get into the magnum stage, you are now out of that and you're in a different lane. And now you got a gun built for power, not balance. But you can hone a magnum in. It takes certain things. And these air gun companies, I don't think they are, have an idea. But in any way, let's get out of this. Let's find out where we get with our gun. I didn't mean to take up your time. We've got another clip coming up. Um, we'll see you on the next clip. Well, as promised, here we go on how I clean these types of bores. Now, remember, these bores are different than, uh, say, your air arms or your Virock guns. These guns are made for power, and a lot of these guns have a lot of crudeness going for them. They're not your high-end guns. So you have your typical barrel, right, from Crossman, Benjamin. Um, you know, I don't know where they're made. I'm going to guess they're made in China. It's the same thing with the Turkish gun, right, or some other Chinese rifle. By the time you get these guns, they could be filthy, dirty, full of grime, grease. God knows some could have a rust in them that I've come across. So what happens with this is you really need to clean it. And if you go to clean this like you do your typical Virock, well, then you're not going to get the barrel clean enough. And then when you do your pellet to bore test, that grime that's left behind it you thought was out of there is not, and it's going to fool you, making you think you got a good pellet to bore fit. Then you go to shoot the gun, the gun's kind of shooting erratic, there's not consistency there, and you don't know why. So let's get into this, I'm going to show you how I do it. Now it's a shop here, I got a trash can, and I'm going to get messy, we're rolling our sleeves back, but we're going to get the job done right, okay? If you're at home, you can do this too, but there's some things I do you may want to take to do outside. So first thing I do is I have the goo gone. Now if you don't know, goo gone is what air gunners use to get into the bore and get the bore saturated and clean. So what I do, I take the barrel cause off, off the gun because I can and I'll take the breech seal out because it's going to get messy. And basically I have a nice tin here that I start getting my patches for cleaning the barrel out all soaked and soaked and so that basically um, they're not damp, they're soaked, dripping. And basically I get them ready. Then I flood the bore with the goo going, totally flood the bore. And I even have a syringe to help me sometimes. Uh, you could do, sometimes I used to spray it in, in the barrel. But basically it's all dripping out, it's going in the trash can, it's messy. Um, the breach seal's already been taken out this time. Um, and basically now we're going to let the goo go on, sit in the barrel, I walk away and come back when I'm ready. I'll give it time to do what it needs to do as far as penetrate a little bit, okay? One thing I will say, don't be in a hurry when it comes to your barrel bore, okay? Do not be in a hurry. It's one of the most important things on your air rifle. Um, especially a gun like this, because you want to get to the bottom and find out what type of bore you have. Is it good, bad, mediocre, or doesn't want to do anything for you at all? But at any rate, so we let it sit, we let it saturate, I get busy doing something else, and then when I come back to it, I don't run and jump to the patches, okay? The patches are the last thing that I use. On a barrel like this with the lands and grooves, I go back to the bore brush uh, and rod with the brass brush. Now, before you get excited, and start shaking your head now. There's nothing wrong with a brass bore brush in a barrel like this. What's wrong with it is how you use it. So let's get to the chase. Brass is soft, steel is hard. Brass is not gonna be the winner here, folks. Now, when you have a brass brush, make sure it's new and it's not mangled up because someone didn't use it right, right? You get a nice little brass brush, it's new, Walmart has them. And basically, the bore's been flooded out now, it's been sitting. When you go in the bore with the brass brush, you go in, take your time, go all the way through, and then come back out again. You don't go in the bore back and forth and scrub it like you do a floor. This is not how you use your bore brush. You're only going to damage it, so don't do it. Go in the bore carefully and then go out of the bore, let the bristle spring back, and then when you slowly come back, they all fold the other way, and then you come back out of the bore, and that's how you use a bore brush. So anyway, I do that around 20 times. Then I go to the patches, okay? They're all dripping, they're soaked, they're saturated. No skimping here. 
I got a can, all the stuff's going to drip in a can. Then I start stuffing the patches through. Now, if you have a 25 cal, I would recommend the, uh, what is it, an inch and a half patches. You can get around two of those in the bore where it's all tight, but you can still get them out. The smaller calibers, like 22, 177, tend to like the 7, 8 patches from Walmart. And basically, you put so many of them in, you'll figure out how many on your gun. Uh, make sure they're dripping and soaked wet with the goo gone. Stuff them in there. It's, it's dripping into the can. Who cares, right? There's going to be some collateral damage. <laughs> and anyway, you get them in your barrel, and then you figure out, okay, I can get so many in my gun where I can still get them through, but it's really, you can feel it, right? It's snug in there, and you're pushing it through. Then the first glob comes out totally filthy dirty. Then you go to your second batch of patches. You'll notice that they're going to start coming out clean again, and that's where people generally stop, okay? But don't stop there. That's, that's wrong. A gun barrel like this, you need to, you're just getting something started right so go back to your 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 brass rod do another 20 rounds of in all the way out and then back again do 20 sessions of that then take your patches and start it all over again what you're going to find is when them patches come out of the gun they're going to be just as filthy dirty uh as they were the first time and there is your bingo guys now you know okay this thing needs to be worked so that's what we're here we're working and we're getting the crud out and we ain't leaving until it's done then when you're thoroughly convinced that you finally got clean patches coming out of your gun right after you do with your brass brush then you can blow it all out with your compressor i have um in my shop the super tech brake cleaner from walmart this is what i use and after i blow this gun out with my compressor i got an exhaust fan here i'll use the brake cleaner to go through the bore and dry all that stuff out of there including the breech seal area and then i got the shop compressor then i'm blowing all that out and then when that's all done i go now the important thing is to pelt the bore fit right now if you do that just get your pellet started first just don't put it in and reach for your rod and then start to push it through get the pellet down in the breech and get it down inside the bore then use your rod that way you don't have to fight yourself or hurt yourself into your barrel block do your pellet to bore test on a slight angle like this and that way you can tell does my pellet to bore have a good pellet drag is it free fall have i got a problem in my bore is this bore going to be working for me on my team or is it going to be against me and telling me it doesn't want to play today the least you know now that answer solved you've done your part and now you know the true answer between what's going on with your barrel well i hope that makes sense Take care, and we'll see you on the next clip. Well, I'm noticing a little problem with this Benjamin Trail where the barrel block and the lockup is with the spring jam. If I'm down on the bench like this, um, even with the breech seal in there, and I just grab the barrel and pull up a little bit with my hand, I can get this, this to shift a little bit. And that's not good, it's not acceptable. So I'm also looking at the gap now. Let's see where the camera is for a second. Let me find out where you guys are. I can zoom in a wee bit more. So I've got my gauge here. So there's a gap right here. And I can fit with my gauge a 15 thousandths of an inch down in that gap right here. If I can get the barrel not to move. There it is right there. 15,000th of an inch. Now, the breech seal is coming up above the barrel block. Give me a second. Around 25, I believe. So if I deduct the 15, that gave me about 10 thousandths of an inch that we're actually uh, crushing the seal or squeezing the seal to make the seal work there. And I thought that would be pretty good, but we're having a problem with this guy here so let me move the view out of the way and see where you are now we'll zoom you in a little bit i'm having a problem where the jam under that spring tension is easy enough to move by me grabbing a barrel and twisting my hand like that on it and i don't like it now right now there's no breed seal in there but i was able to do it with the breed seal in there um, there's a little movement So at any rate, what I'm going to do is take this jam out of here, see where you're at here. 
me get you back. I'm going to take the jam out, make a little piece of metal washer, and then stick it in there, and that'll make the spring taunter. Uh, put the spring under more tension, and uh, hopefully the jam won't want to easily pull back on it. Now, I did that before with the breech seal in there. I was using both the factory seal and the o-ring seal and i was messing around with uh, different things even um, seeing what if i made it tighter if it would take that wiggle out of there by adding shims and basically um, we're just going to have to make the spring jam tighter and then get the seal height right on the gun now if your gun has a problem and you don't know about that that definitely could cause you to have a point of impact shift so you know here's the thing with the gun it's very well made as far as steel and all that and they use good steel but the barrel block the fork fit up that's that's just um, as far as i'm concerned that's just not good um, the forks uh, could have been tighter around the barrel block area and this gap didn't need to be 15 thousandths um, and that's just a shame but anyway that's the way it was made but uh, we're going to follow through get this gun done and then move on see you on the next clip all right so i have the jam out now here's is the original spring right i think you can see that pretty good let's get you in there where it looks pretty good and this guy here is a short spring from a Hatson. And you can see the difference between the coils if I come in slow, the thickness in the coils. So this is a lightweight spring compared to what Hatson uses in their magnums. So basically we're gonna have to do something with this spring to make it nice and taut. But anyway, I hope you caught that. I'll be working on this. We'll see you on the next clip. Well, just like we did in the video on the Ruger Airhawk Elite, we have the barrel and the four jaw chuck. Dial indicators within a half a thousand. I am happy with that. Now that we have that squared away, we can finish doing the crown. And then once we do that, we can then machine the other part of the barrel to fit the barrel block. Well, we'll see you on the next clip. Thanks for hanging out. Alrighty, I have it zoomed in. I don't think I could go in anymore. Let's try a little bit, see what happens. I think I'm just going to leave it where it is. Um, let me get rid of this guy here. We'll do our cotton test and check the landing grooves. Of course, I already know we're good. I'm just doing it for your benefit because you get to see some of the stuff that happens um, when you do your barrels. You're just checking for snags, and we're good to go. Now I went from 220 to 600 grit. I'm not gonna go any more than that. That's fine. We're not making mirrors here, even though it looks like a mirror. Um, and that's it, so we'll see you on the next clip. Well, welcome to the picture show here. I left a lot of things out, so what you see in the video is what I decided to disclose, and what you don't, you don't. But anyway, if you um, need to take a break, you can pause the video, because we're going to be a little while, and I'm going to do my best to get through it. Or maybe you need to make a phone call, but anyway, we'll be waiting for you if you do. For everybody else, let's get started. All right, well, here's a Viroc company, and they're looking up through the barrel. See that? And they are adjusting the bore by bending the barrel. And here's another gun. I didn't read the story. Um, basically, it was somebody was presented with this, and it actually works. And the barrel's all bent around the tube. Now, I say all that to show all that, that you definitely can bend the barrel and adjust the barrel. And I um, did that because that's what we did in our video. Now, let's get rolling, and let's talk about this. So here's our little older barrel. It's 22 cal. It's being configured for the O-ring breech seal. Now everybody knows by now we took the buttons off the piston, we remachined new buttons, and basically we bored the bottom of this one so when we put the button in it'll have a place to stop as well as hit the face of the piston when, when it's inserted. And there's our button looking nice. And the bottom of the button has the divot for the gas rim arm to pivot on. And here we are press fitting it into the piston with the red Loctite. And that's done. And this project had two pistons 
and I did the same thing took the buttons off redid the buttons um, now there's no room on the bottom of the Benjamin trails piston for a, oh, a Baron ring a Delrin Baron ring like I like to make and further looking into the receiver tube There's no room to put I don't even think you could put a paper sticky uh, Macari button on it, but anyway what I did do is take the middle of the piston down That way the front of the piston with the seal and the back is the only thing riding in the tube And the other one we did the same except for we took and drilled four holes making it a little bit lighter and um let's go let's continue on we got a lot to cover here's our barrel right 22 low to all the barrel and it has three baffles up front underneath the crown as far as the choke we didn't give it a choke but we did give it a press fit sleeve that's what i decided to do for this one we have a really good exceptional pelt to bore fit too all right now we are uh, back with our pistons we're drilling a hole on both sides of the piston that way we can machine some uh pins and then button the piston and then it'll be bulletproof but at any rate here's our barrel block right our barrel block is in there uh, with a new barrel in it and the barrel is curing so when the agents are all cured the curing agents are cured uh, basically then you can start drilling it out like we're doing here in the mill Here's our locking pin with the red lock tight on. That's being put in as we speak. And here the collar's already done, so that's been drilled out. And this is the finished product. Now, if you need to take the barrel out of this Benjamin Trail, what you need to do first is push the spring jam back because this collar here holds that in place. Then you punch the collar out, and then you can punch the pin out, and then you can punch the barrel out. And that's how it is done. Now, here's our new breech. Basically, um, our breech is totally sealed in the barrel block. I found out a lot of these guys that do barrels, companies, they're not sealed very well, and you can get blow by when you shoot your gun through the barrel block, between the barrel and the block. All this is open up to each other inside, and the Benjamin Trail is no different. If you pull the barrel off, you'll see there's very little Loctite agent on it. Now we're going to do an o-ring breed seal because I didn't like the Benjamin Trails breed seal Although it was wider and I like that, but I don't like the material to me. It seems like it's on the hard side Now in this project we found the problem as far as the barrel block to the fork um, I'm sorry barrel block to the receiver fit so the top had a gap of 15 thousandths and the bottom had a gap of 11 thousandths and later on you'll see me taking care of that issue and here we have the o-ring in there for our new breech seal now if you want to upgrade your benjamin trail if you got one that seems to be shooting good if you're the gold ticket winner you can go to ace hardware and get a o-ring breech seal just like you see here that's where i got mine and you can call crossman and ask for the breech seal shims get maybe six you'll have some spares and work out what you need for a breech seal and with that let's move on there's another view of it and there's back to our piston with the pins we inserted. They've been press fit. Now we're just waiting for them to cure. And now they've been machined off nice and smooth and even. And let's take a look here. We have a little issue going on into the Benjamin Trails receiver, at least on this one. At the very bottom inside the air chamber, basically once I had the piston down in there with the new seal, what you want to do is start traveling it through little by little just to see what the consistency is or if there's a problem or maybe it's going to be fighting you like it did mine. So we were trying to push it down and all of a sudden it didn't want to go. So we knew there was an issue. We wound up being able to take care of that problem uh, simply by honing that area for a good while and we were able to get it. Now it's not sun and hones. It's just honed any which way basically and we got it. Now we don't have the problem. What else is there? Well, when you have your receiver, take the time to inspect it, right? Many guys just go through the gun, clean out the old stuff, and just start slapping things together. Don't do that. It's your air rifle. You need to put the time into it. Check the bottom out. Maybe you'll have something goofy going on there. And if you didn't check it, you never would have known it. But also, some of these bombs are all caked up with uh, too much um, of the wrong lube. And it just starts baking and creating a big mess like a frying pan that's never been cleaned out from day one. Once you get that all cleaned up, you're back to where you need to be. And also, you have your 
uh, what is it, your air chamber porthole there, you can dish it out, right? Ream it out, give it a little slight chamfer. It doesn't need to be perfect. A little bit of something is better than nothing. You don't have to go crazy. And then clean all that out after you do that and sand it across the top to make sure no burrs are sticking up on the edge and just get it all out of there. We'll talk more about the tube later. So here's our gun. We are Cerakoting it. Now, it wasn't the original color that I wanted. But what happens around here is we get these ideas for projects and then we start buying stuff and then then we wound up buying a barrel to get it ready. Well, it took two years by the time we actually got to this project and the Cerakote paint that I originally bought for it turned out to be bad by the time we went to use it. And also the barrel turned out to be a bad barrel. But anyway, we're back on track. I just happened to use what was in the shop and that was a graphite black. Here we're putting our yellow stencils on because we're going to do our next coat on top which would be the burnt bronze and here you can see us pulling the stencils off revealing these so-called tiger stripes um, and there it is getting almost completed and there we are done now it's got a kind of a neat military look and a lot of guys get their guns done in this particular uh, color these two colors but anyway, back to our receiver tube. Now look how clean this has been honed down. I call it processing the tube. You should put all the care in the world when you go over your air rifle and never be in a rush. So I call it processing the tube and that includes a tube inspection. Now um, you want to hone and clean this area out good and take your time underneath to get all these areas smoothed out, right? Even under here, including especially all the way down at the end of your cocking slot where you just enter the breech, uh, just enter the air chamber. Make sure you hone that out like under here real good. The more you get out of there, the more easier it is to get your piston down. And it depends on what gun it is as far as what you're going to do in the air chamber. But if you inspect the air chamber, especially if it's a used gun, you may find out what somebody did before. Maybe it was cross-tatched. And anyway, the choice is yours, what lubes you're going to use and how you're going to go about to do your particular gun. With that, let's go on. I want, oh, one thing I want to say is back here, remember, we have a threaded cap that goes in. So you've got to go through some threads. You can hone the threads down. There's no problem with that. You're not going to hurt anything. You can take the sharp edge off the outside uh, edge of those threads, and you can still get your cap and in plug in if you have a plug. So don't worry about that. Well, we found out that this particular gun was gone in the receiver tube, so we had to take care of that issue. And basically, here's what it looks like, right? We got a two-piece cocking arm, which I really favor. And this is what they give you from the Benjamin Company. It sits right there, and it keeps this area from going. But they did nothing for this area. So we milled this out and basically made our own little piece. Now this is going to go right back when you cock the gun. This is going to skate on top of the slot, and we're not going to have any more problems. Well, sometimes when you work on a gun, basically, uh, if you have a lot going on, you can get... Um, what do they call that blindsided you can tunnel vision well this got by me and when i found it finally i was surprised i didn't see it quicker this is your barrel pivot bolt and this is a magnum doing 900 feet per second at my elevation now i tend to lose 15 to 20 feet per second because i'm a high elevation but this gun can do much more probably maybe around 925 and 22 cal so this needs a lock and screw this is a magnum and it's almost at the top of the high powered magnums i'm pretty sure a hatsum 135 dishes out a little bit more but anyway we put a lock and screw on that and that way we're going to get rid of the old barrel bolt where it wants to loosen up on you after you go through your shooting sessions we're not going to have it and here we are we're going through it now we're tapping it and this is what it looks like and here it's done now if anybody's interested i'm just going to say it real quick yes i see this little piece but anyway this is offset and te technically you want to put them in the center but Murphy's Law struck on this one and where the slot was for the barrel bolt when it was all tightened was in the worst spot could be and so we just offset it, our little hole for the set screw that way we can get it into the barrel uh, bolts head in a different position and we were able to do it no problem but anyway um, what else I would say once I did this then I cleaned it all up put the barrel block in tightened up the bolt and then went on top of the bolt right back here again and took our little half moon piece out and that's how we did this one 
But anyway, let's keep going. And here's what the screw looks like. Four millimeter cap head screw that we machine the head down so we can basically be closer to the receiver and not poke out. Now we're going to address the issue with our barrel block. You know, I'm going to say we had a lot of issues with this gun and we fixed every single one of them. But right now we got to take care of the gap between the receiver tube and the barrel block. So for that we took and notched out the barrel block from top and bottom. We're given a recessed ditch of whatever you want to call it and we're fairly getting level here and now we laid in a bead of silver solder and filled it all up and came up with a nice bead of silver solder. And basically what we're going to do is file the solder down until we can eventually get our barrel block in and closed and properly without the gap between the receiver and the barrel block. And that took care of that problem. Well, here we have our two-piece cocking arm. Nice thing about two-piece cocking arm is it allows you to take the barrel off without taking all the guts out of the receiver. And that's really nice. But anyway, we're going to install it. And here's our pin for the cocking arm. And once you push these out, you lose the flare. And then sometimes these get buggered up. And if this hole is tight as this one is, you're not going to be able to get it in unless you spend a half a day trying to smooth it and clean it and make it round again. So I just put a new pin in there and flared it and we were done. We can save this for some other gun later on. All right, well, here's some crony results. We're going to crony a gun later. There's a big surprise at the end of this clip. But anyway, let's take a look what we have here. So we're using the 14.3 grain Crossman Premiers, right? We got our 22 cal of the wall barrel. You can see it says 890 for our high, as well as the numbers here. Now, I threw two numbers out, and they were the highest ones, which was 896.0 and 896.0 again. Because of the Crossman pelts, basically the sizes are all over the place, and I didn't take time to measure them and go through them and clean them and all that, which you should do if you really want good, proper results. I uh, just didn't have time for all that, and we needed to get something done. And anyway, we threw the two high ones out, so that gave us an 881 and an 890 for the high. Now, our elevation, like I said, is 3,100 feet, so I tend to lose 15 to 20 feet per second. So with these numbers, not only am I pretty consistent, but it also tells me we are where we need to be. So let's move on. All right, here's what our little set screw looks like inside our barrel bolt. So now the bolt cannot loosen up on you. And our crown is here waiting for everybody else to get their job done. He has a quick little message for anybody who has ears to hear. Do you want to hear what he has to say? Well, first of all, okay, good for you. He says, look, guys, I'm a low the wall barrel. I'm the proper length for the size power of this gun, right? I'm also not a bad diameter either. And basically, I'm a good pelt to bore fit. But I got one thing which I got to tell you. I can do my job, but I can't do my job if everybody else is not doing their job. Do you get it? So the air gun just does not rely on me alone. Everybody else on the air gun has to do their job. And that means everybody and everything. It all needs to come together. Anyway, let's move on. So here we're putting some blue Loctite on. This is the big bolt for the trigger guard. Just want to point out, a lot of times you can't get a lock and washer on your trigger guard bolt because it doesn't fit in the hole on the trigger guard like the head does. Well, if that's the case, you need to grind one down and get it on. You got a Magnum shooting 900 feet per second. It's going to need all the help it can to keep it where it needs to stay, and that is holding the line. All right, let's move on here. We're getting there. So there we are. Let me know what you think of this um, configuration here, the so-called tagger stripe configuration. Now, the Picatinny rail and the Benjamin trail worked out just fine. If you have hats, and sometimes they've been known to mess you up, so that's when you got to go to the one-piece mount on the hats, and, and basically, hopefully, you got a four-screw uh, one piece mount so it's anchored tight but sometimes those rails are off and you can't tell until you get problems and that's when uh, you just get rid of that and go back to the one piece mount but we didn't have any problem on ours ours worked out really great i love picatinny rails well here's our silver solder and this is left here because the barrel block is above the receiver at this point and i did figured no reason to take it down it's all been taken down underneath where it belongs and now we don't have any gap between the barrel block and the receiver 
So the scope we're using is a Hawk scope Air Max. Um, I looked into that and I liked the reviews and I talked to Joe Rhea about it and he highly recommended it. And you know what? It's been pretty good so far. I haven't had any problems. All right, now we're going to talk about, let's get you adjusted here, the, the groups, okay? 18 yards, 22 cal, Benjamin Trail with our little old barrel. Here's our groups. Now, I want to talk about what you're doing when you rebarrel a gun. I'm going to try to get through it quick. You're going to take your scope, and it needs to be the magnum rated scope, and what you want to do is make sure your scope rifle is set to its center, okay? You, whether you do the clicks or the looking in the mirror and remember if you do do the clicks don't go greedy and try to keep forcing another click at it when it starts to tighten up or snug up stop so you know how to do that that's great get it to the center then mount it on your gun then when you shoot at this bullseye here you're going to find out that your point of impact is nowhere near it most likely well the idea is to leave your reticles alone leave them at the center and start bending and adjusting the barrel now if you're way off you, you do it in different parts of the barrel you don't do it all in one place and um, basically you start shifting the barrel until you watch your point of impact get closer and closer to the dot the bullseye you're aiming at now here's what we got on this one so far at 18 yards we got three pellets touching here and two pellets touching there and also we have another one and here we got them a little closer than that you got a typical flyer which comes with air guns so that my friend is a magnum gun which is suiting and honed in and everything is looking good now i do want to point out and i'm trying to get through this so don't mind my yapping if you have shrouds and baffles like we do and you go to bend your barrel like this to shift the point of impact that's great you want your magnum scope in the center of its radical for its, it's where it's the strongest. Then when you reach out further, then you got something working with you. But when you do shift the barrel like this, like the, to get the point of impact to shift, most likely your baffle shrouds are going to start clipping. Now, the only way to get around that is just to make the holes in the baffles bigger so you don't have an issue. And basically, um, they won't be as quieter if you make the holes bigger. But you got to give and take. You get one, you, you, you've got to just do what you got to do. I'm just pointing that out. But anyway, um, also when you have a gun and you're shooting a gun and your gun is not accurate, say you got one here, one over here, one down here, that's telling you you have a problem and you have to figure out what it is and fix it. So at any rate, most of the time shooters know that you need to be proper set up, right? So... My wife just made me a big extra bean bag just so we can go through this process so it could stabilize me better. But anyway, the bean bag seems to be working. All right, let's go on the next clip. And I just want to point this out. Now, look, can you see that? 30 yards. And this is not our gun, but this is a 135 Hatson that came through this shop. What we did to this gun was the same thing. We went through it from stem to stern. We rebarreled it. Now, Doug wanted a 22 cal in the 135 Hatson, and I practically begged him to go with a 25 cal because that power of a gun the 25 cal suits it better because the bore is bigger also we have a new rebarrel so then the length of the barrel is going to be proper as well not that ridiculous 10 and a half inch board that had some puts on there but anyway look we honed it all in he sent me this group at 30 yards guys this is simply outstanding i'm going to zoom you in more because you need to take the time to look at this here's three touch in here right and then i'm going to say there's one two three i'm going to say there's four pellets right here that is outstanding at 30 yards you can hone a magnum in who said what good is a magnum if you can't hit the side of the barn well what good is air guns if you don't look into them and fix the problems that they have Anyway, let's take a look here. We're going to move on. We have our shop foreman. So normally when he's around, that's Mr. Scooter. Everybody's on the quiet side. And he was pretty quiet today. He was just checking things out. He didn't say anything, so that means it's good. Usually if he has something to say, it means it's bad. But he did say something about this, which I was surprised. He said, whose idea was this to Cerakote the stock? And he liked it, so that was good. Well, we did. We Cerakoted the stock. It actually goes well, really good with this particular gun. So, I don't know. You can let me know what you think about it. Now, here's that piston I was telling you about. Look how tight that is in the receiver tube for as far as room. But anyway, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. 
and here's our pistons just for the heck of it i did weigh the two so this is one with the holes coming in at 11 ounces 0.4 and this one without the holes came in 11 ounces 0.8 not much of a difference and with that we're all done now here is the spoiler alert we do have a new um, rifle stock coming from Crossman Company. We have a new receiver tube company coming from the Crossman Company for the Benjamin Trail. And we already have the new fresh Serico paint that I originally wanted to paint the gun in. Yes, we're going to have a do-over because I can't stand it anymore. want to see what color turns out if I would have had my original color. So there will be a spoiler alert. We'll see what happens. Well, thanks for hanging out. We'll see you on the next clip. All right, well, today happens to be Cerakote Day in the shop. We've got some projects to wrap up. Let's go take a look and see what we have going on here today. There's some stencils going on for one. Um, so basically, we had the end of the Benjamin Trail that we're redoing because I didn't like that particular color after it got done. And I finally got the color that I initially wanted. You may have heard me talk about it. And we also have a .20 cal Beeman R1 on the right there. Not sure what I'm going to do. The receiver in, I do know the barrel is going to be black. We have some shroud tubes, and there's the Benjamin Trail with the big Picatinny rail on it. That's going to get redone. Well, now we're going to just crank up the oven, let this stuff bake out for 300 degrees for an hour, just to make sure any oil that may have been missed that wasn't cleaned off comes to the surface, and we'll find out. But anyway, We'll see you on the next clip when we're all done. Just wanted to get a little video of some of this stuff. All right, welcome to the end of the trail with the Benjamin Trail. I thought that was funny. Finally, we are there. Well, our new stock came in. It was a light finish, and it looks nice because it actually looks natural, and it seems to go well with this. And our new receiver tube is a lot better than the original one, and I was happy that I reordered a new receiver tube. And we got our color configuration and what I originally wanted rather than the burnt bronze, which I really didn't care for in this gun. And well, basically we found a lot of problems with this gun. We went through the gun from stem to stern and fixed every single one of them. Part one, I said this was my favorite gun. That was before I found all the different problems wrong with it. And I put my shop glasses on, took a closer in-depth look and I go, wow unbelievable it wasn't the bank vault fit that i thought it was but at any rate we addressed them all and we fixed all the problems with the gun so now we have a magnum that's powerful it's smooth and it's accurate right one ragged hole at 18 yards with a zeroed out scope what more do you want and we have a shroud that's no longer going to give you any problems and even has three baffles underneath of it so i think we finally got where we wanted to get with this gun and basically, I'm so glad it's done also. But anyway, let's just move on. We'll see you on another project. I'm glad we're done. You take care. Be safe. And we'll see you on the next one.